function f is the step function of a processor, you now have a virtual machine and you can execute and step with a virtual machine. If your function f is the transition function of a blockchain and the states are the actual state of the blockchain and the prior values are transactions, you have a rollup. So AVC, super useful model, hack can we realize this. Um, this is like, I think the volume construction. And the idea is that you have, along with your state, the prover will prove the function f and will produce a proof. And this proof gets updated with every step of the computation. The question is what happens inside this black box pf? So because we're updating the state, we're also updating the function, we're performing the function f. So our prover will have to do f in some kind of circuit. We're also updating the proof. So we need some extra computation, which right now we're just going to box and call overhead. And the question is, how much do we have to pay on top of just running the function f? So how much is the overhead? As you notice, like, we're paying for the overhead with every step of our incremental computation. So ideally, we'll keep that as low as possible. So this kind of a historical approach, like, what did we do? We're like, okay, we want the overhead to be super small. Great, we have snarks. Snarks are succinct, have short verifiers. That should definitely be the thing we put there as like our extra work. So by doing a snark to snark, that's sort of the approach that you have in Plunky 2 or how um, Starkware do their recursion. And what you do is with every step, the prover will take in a proof, read the whole proof, run the whole verifier, and produce a new proof. So everything happens in circuit. Um, this is actually super expensive. I think Fractal does this in a million R1 CS constraints. If you want to do Graph 16 within Graph 16 without going into fancy curve cycles, I think um, the Zero X Park people have a circuit with 20 million constraints. So this is some pretty crazy circuitry. Can we do any better? Yes. Um, this is the halo idea, where with every step of the computation, you take in a proof, you read the whole proof, but you don't run the whole verifier. You run sort of what we call the easy part of the verifier, which is like working with evaluations. And the hard part, which is checking polynomial commitments, you defer till the very end. So the idea is with every step, you only do part of the verifier, you accumulate the hard stuff, and the hard stuff you'll do once at the end outside of the circuit. Um, I forgot the numbers here, but I think this takes you significantly down in constraints to like about 100,000 sort of R1CS equivalent. Can we do better than this? Yes. Again, there's this paper called PCD without succinct arguments. And PCD is sort of a, a more general version of incrementally verifiable computation. And what they do is they say, all right, actually, we don't need to read the whole proof. So we just need to read part of the proof, a small part of it. We just need to run part of the verifier. And we defer reading the whole proof and doing the hard verification till the very end. And this is sort of the first time where you have a small and constant uh, recursion overhead. This is great. Can we do any better than this? Yes. And this is kind of the folding approach from Nova. So we do actually these high eyes that we call proof or IVC proof will actually not be proofs. They'll be unproven instances. And we'll see in a second instance witness exactly what I mean. So you take unproven instances, you compress the new one into a running instance. And what you actually do is you defer proving until the very end. So with every step of your computation, you're no longer proving. You're just compressing things together, and you'll prove that compressed thing at the very end. Okay. This takes you down to about 20,000 constraints, R1CS. And the question now is, can we do any better? Um, and yeah, deferring proving sort of seems like we can't do any better. But the question is, maybe we can represent our circuit um, in something that is more efficient than our one cs So the question is, can we do this sort of Nova construction with a folding scheme, but for something other than our one cs 
I'll take a second here just in case you have questions. Um, feel free to type them in the chat. Otherwise, I will move on. So are you trying, so the question is, uh, we are trying our other advertisations in hopes for better representability or anything else? Um, it's exactly that. We're hoping that we can represent our circuits in something that is more efficient. Also, this is where I lack some knowledge, but probably some proving systems are more efficient than others, and some proving systems work with specific advertisations. But yeah, the idea here was, all right, can this can we express this recursion overhead in the Plunk circuit rather than in our one cs circuit, hoping that it will be faster to prove. Similarly for our function f, maybe our function f benefits from being expressed as a Plunk circuit with custom gates or uh, a very wide circuit. And can we still support the Nova style recursion in that sense? Quick definition so that we all agree, and I'm sorry for people who are super familiar with Plunk, you've seen this 50,000 times, um, but let's do this quickly. So Plunk trace is kind of like a Sudoku. It's a grid, has a fixed size. Uh, the goal is to fill the cells with numbers, and numbers here are in quotation marks because we want, we're working with a finite field. And you have rules that you have to follow. So. Like in the Sudoku, some of the values are already filled in for you. So you have all this stuff on the left that we call selectors already filled in. And stuff on the right, some of it is filled in by the verifier. So we call those the public inputs. The first rule we have to follow is copy constraints. So here I've marked squares with colors. Two squares that have the same color need to have the same value. The second rule is what we call the gate equation. And it, this applies at each row. And you see down here this equation. You see that our, each of our columns have a label. We want the values along each row to follow, to satisfy this equation. Great. A circuit is defined by the selectors, the concrete values that are in here on the left, and the rules. So the concrete uh, copy constraints and the concrete gate equation that you choose to use. The part on the right, which is what the prover and verifier get to play with, we divide into two parts. The top part we call the instance part, which is the part that the verifier gets to play with. And the bottom part is the witness, which only the prover gets to use. Um, I don't know, maybe some of you here at PSC are familiar with the, the Halo 2 ecosystem and they define their instance slightly differently as a whole column. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> Let's stick to this definition, but these definitions are actually equivalent. Cool. So now a definition of a folding scheme. So this is a slide from Dan Bonet's uh, lecture in the Zero Knowledge Proof MOOC that's going on at the moment. Um, so a folding scheme, as I said earlier, compresses two instances into one. So the first thing is we have to fix a circuit C. And by fixing a circuit, remember that we mean fixing the selectors, the copy constraints, and the gate equation. So we fix the circuit, and then we have two parties, a prover and a verifier. The prover knows two instance witness pairs. So it knows instance one, witness one, that corresponds to it, and instance two, witness two. So the verifier knows only the instances, instance one and two. The prover sends a message T, we'll see what that message is. The verifier sends some randomness. And at the output, the prover now has a new instance witness pair, which I'll also call a trace. It has a new trace. And the verifier has a new instance. 
the important properties here are completeness. So if x1, w1, and x2, w2 were satisfying assignments to the circuit, then xw, the output, must also be a satisfying assignment. Cool. And now knowledge soundness, which is kind of the, the important part. If a prover knows a satisfying witness to x, and x is the output of the folding, it must have known with high probability satisfying witnesses to x1 and x2. I'll put say that again. Um, if you as a prover are able to produce a value w which satisfies x, you must have known values w1 and w2 which satisfied x1 and x2. And this is a very important thing. Even though we've compressed two instances into one, we haven't lost the requirements on the proof. Cool. So how do we do this for Plunk? Um, this is our first attempt. We have two traces, trace prime and trace double dash, right, however you want to call it. And we're going to take a random linear combination of them. So we take a random value R, we multiply all the values inside one of the traces by R, and then we add things together. So copy constraints, we're very lucky, are going to be preserved. So if the blue squares here, A prime one, B prime three, are equal to each other, and the blue squares here, A second one and A second three, are equal to each other, then when I multiply by R, they're going to be equal, and when I add things together, everything is still equal. So A one, B three, are equal to each other. And we have satisfied the cost constraint. The reason that worked was because these constraints are actually of degree one. The problem is that our gauge equation is not linear. And we can't actually do this naively. Um, I could show you on the whiteboard afterwards why it doesn't work. It, it is a bit messy but we have plenty of time, so maybe that's something we'll do. What we do instead is we learn from what Nova did. Nova says, all right, actually the gate equation, you can slightly modify it, or you can relax it in a way that will allow folding. And the second thing is proven verifier, so the verifier needs to remain succinct, but it still needs to check that the prover is honest. And so to do that, the verifier will work with commitment, while the prover will work with the actual trace. So this mot motivates what we call the relaxed Planck arithmetization. And so the idea is a relaxed witness will be a Planck witness, as we knew it, so this lower part of the trace, and a narrow vector. And we'll see how we use it later. The instance is still the public input from a Planck circuit, as we know them, so the top part of that trace that we saw earlier, a scalar U, we'll see how we use it, and commitment to each of the columns in the witness. So you have, I'm using um, this notation where a box with something in it is a commitment to whatever's inside the box. And the important thing here is the relaxed gate equation. So you see that this U pops up in places and that this E goes up in places. How did we do this? Again, we'll do this more um, sequentially on the whiteboard. The idea here is actually, we're gonna look at this equation. We're gonna assume selectors to be, so the sectors are fixed, right? We said we have a fixed circuit. So the sectors are not variables. Our variables are the A's, the B's, the C's, the U and the E we can ignore for now. So ignoring E for now, what we did with you is actually we made everything of the same degree. Right, so this term here is of degree two. This term here is of degree zero, the QC. So we multiplied it by U squared to make it degree two. All these terms here are of degree one, so we multiply them by U to make them of degree two. The reason we do this, um, and I hope I have it written on the next slide, I, I think I do. So we'll see in a second why we do this. How do we fold with this relaxed arithmetization? Kind of in the same way as before. 
um, we're still going to take our linear combination, linear combination of our traces with this random R. The new scalar U, we're also going to just take a random linear combination. And the error vector is sort of the freedom we have to correct any mistake. So let's keep it free for now and see in a second what we do with it. Now, this is the important part, and this is why we made our equation, our gate equation to be. If I compute my gate, and by gate I mean the whole gate equation, over the final trait, which is this linear combination of the incoming traces, because my gate equation is of degree two, I'll actually something, have something of this form, where I have gate of trace prime plus r times something plus r squared times gate of trace second. This looks a bit like magic, um, unless you're familiar with like, homogeneous polynomials. Um, we can happily write this out afterwards on the whiteboard. The question is, how do we get rid of this T? What do we do about this T? And this is where our error term comes in. We can say, all right, let's define the new error term to be the incoming ones, and to remove the term RT that we don't care about. And the nice thing about this is that T is fully defined before we know R. We don't need to know R to come up with this term T. So overview of the protocol, the prover can compute T because it doesn't depend on R. It commits to it and sends it to the verifier. The verifier will sample a random value, send it back to the prover. And now they can both compute. The prover will compute over the trace, as we saw earlier. And I think I forgot to have u here. There should be linear combination of the traces, linear combination of u, and the special equation for our error term. And the verifier will do the same thing, but over commitment. All right, so recall that our relaxed instance had commitment to the witness values. So we can use the commitments we have from both instances to compute commitments to the new witness without ever seeing, sorry. We can use the commitments we had to the incoming witnesses to compute the commitment to the new witness without ever having to see the witness or the new one, the old ones, anything. And same with the error term. Because we were given this commitment to T, we can compute a new commitment to the new error term. Skip some details. This is stuff from the paper. We will get back to this. And hopefully by the end of this, uh, this will seem intuitive. Performance. What the verifier has to do is this work over commitment. So if we count this up, we have um, five scalar times a commitment, which when we're going to be using elliptic curves, this is going to be a scalar multiplication. So we have five scalar multiplications um, and similarly five additions, point additions. What happens in practice is we'll be folding a relaxed instance with a non-relaxed instance or it's not yet relaxed, so the error term is going to be zero for one of the two incoming instances. So actually, one of the additions here, we don't really need to do. So we can take this down to four point additions and four multiplications, assuming that this E double dash is zero. In Nova, they do this with only two point additions, because they have one point addition for the error term and one point addition for the single witness. They only have one witness column, whereas we have three. How does this extend to uh, the nice features of Plunk? So wide circuits, if you have an extra column, you'll need one extra witness commitment. And if you see here, if we add like one line of witness commitment, we'll have one more addition. So cost for wider circuits, we get, we need one extra point addition. For high degree gates. And this, I think, let's also write it out later. What happens is if we have a homogeneous polynomial of degree higher than two, let's say degree D, 
we will have more crossings, but we will still have this nice um, this nice pattern where we have r to the zero times the left incoming trace, witness, whatever it is we're computing. We'll have r to the highest power times the other incoming trace and a bunch of cross -tons. So we can still work in the same way we did. We'll just have more cross ones and therefore the prover will have to spend more commitments. And again, in computing the error term here, there'll be more additions for the verifier. So again, we have one extra point addition per extra degree. Cool. The question with all this, if we go back to our IVC and our overhead is, by adding columns and adding stuff to my gate equation, can I make this verifier circuit, so the circuit that performs mostly scalar multiplications and point additions, can this thing be more performant? And is there a trade-off to be hit? Like, oh, if I add five columns, okay, I'm paying for five more, five more point additions, but maybe I've made them all 20 times cheaper. I don't know. Um, this is kind of a game for the circuit wizards out there, so hopefully we'll have implementations out soon and you can try this out. And that's kind of it for now. Um, the next thing is we just defined a folding scheme, all the rest, how we do IVC, um, how do we get uh, succinct IVC, so like a nice little snark at the end, all that we can use the results from Nova. We can also do supernova with it. We just plug out all the r one cs stuff and plug in this long canon and sangria stuff. Lookups are a work in progress. I can chat about some ideas as well during the Q&A. And yeah, hopefully implementation will be done soon so you can have fun trying to get the circuit back to the fall. Now, that's it for the presentation, or at least the sort of slides part of Talk. Um, I'll take some questions now to clarify things, and then I'll bring up the paper, bring up a whiteboard, and we'll get started properly. So these scalar multiplications, generally very expensive, are done in their native field in the IVC verifier. This depends what you do. So you can do them in their native fields if you're using curve cycles. And why do we need cycles? I'll show you now. We, the verifier is working with these commitments, right? And it's, a, but it's also working with the public inputs, which I've hidden away from here. I think we can see it. Where's the slide where I have the proper, there we go. We can see it here. The verifiers work. Ooh, Never mind. The verifiers work. Equation 10 here. You see the verifier is working over um, actual scalars. Like it's working over the actual trace, the elements of the trace, but it's also working over commitments. And these commitments commit to values of the trace. So they are actually represented in practice by points of an elliptic curve. And the points of this curve have a base field which is different from the finite fields we're using for our wires, for our trace values. So what we do is if we have cycles, we're good. If we don't have cycles, we have to do non-native arithmetic. Folding lookups. Does it depend on the lookup system or the newest ones such as CQ can also be folded? Is it mentioned somewhere how to do lookup folding? So there are works right now um, I know there's one thing called origami, and there's a post on VK Research as well addressing this. Um, I think we're not fully there yet. The intuition behind these posts is the right one, and I think I'll keep this for a bit later. First, I do want to talk about like the, the basic scheme and going through the paper properly. Um, but yes, it does depend on what scheme you use, and CQ is sort of known to be aggregatable, and I think that probably will make it easier to, I guess, fold CQ. But yeah, don't quote me on this. I haven't looked into it. I've been looking at 
uh, plug up mainly. Is the N16 ZK snark similar to the one in the Nova paper? Can the same one be used? So in Nova at the end, or similarly with this IVC construction, what you end up with, these proofs in our case are actually instance witness pairs. They're traces of this relaxed Planck arithmetization, which we do need to prove at the end. The snark that is shown in Nova works for relaxed r one cs So we can't use that one exactly. We'll have to take a variant of Planck, um, which works for relaxed Planck. Um, essentially, what you need to do is remove the first round and make sure that the verifier does all their protocol, but using the commitments that they already hold the witness. Let me see. I'll, I'll give you a bit of information for this. Long paper. Um, if we scroll down to where the protocol happens, there we go. This is round one. The W values are sort of the, the witness values, as we've seen. Multiplying them by the Lagrange polynomial means we actually create a polynomial from each witness column. And this is some masking to make things zero knowledge. And then these things, commitments to these things, get sent to the verifier. In our case, we have to get rid of this round one, and we have to say the verifier already holds commitments to the witness column. So if you want to do it zero knowledge, you have to be a bit tricky about it. If you don't want zero knowledge, you can just keep going with the protocol here, but starting from round two. So now let's look at the Sangria paper and see how everything we've talked about so far maps to things happening in the paper. So introduction, some notation, bold letters are vectors, big bold letters are matrices. Clock arithmetization, this is sort of how I write out the gate equation. I say G for, I guess, circuit, U is the set of selectors. I is the specific row we're looking at, and A, B, C are our columns. And this is the gate equation as you know it. Um, all this text we can ignore. This is sort of the saying uh, a trace is divided into a top part and a bottom part, instance and witness. And this is folding schemes in a very uh, informal way. Okay. So the sangria itself, as we saw earlier, we make things homogeneous. And maybe this is time to bring out the whiteboard. Yeah, this is time to bring out the whiteboard. Okay. So why do we care about making things homogeneous? Let's, let's hope that this works. So we have two left a can you see what I'm writing? Oh, that's worrying. Oh, there we go. You write V plus you output C plus this multiplication AB plus QC. Great, and that C looks a bit like a C, so I'm very sorry. All right. Let's look just at, let's say, QLA. And what happens if I replace A and I say this is actually equal to A1 plus RA2? This is not rocket science. We'll have this is equal to QLA1 plus RA2. And this is QLA1 plus RQLA2. So, so far we're happy, right? Because we have, let's see if I can highlight things here. This is kind of the gate equation as before. Oh my, no, this is horrible. <laughs> Let me undo this. This looks like the left selector times A as before. This also looks like the left selector times A as before multiplied by something, but that's fine because if we have our whole gate equation multiplied by something, because the gate evaluates zero, we're happy. 
Like it's still going to evaluate to zero, even if we've multiplied it by R. The problem is when we reach our multiplication gate, um a b and let's say that b is actually equal to c1 plus r b2 we'll have q m a1 plus r a2 factored by c1 plus r b2 and now if we write this out i'm going to have q m times let's look at degree one term uh the terms that have no r first so a1 b1 so far we're happy because that's kind of that that does look like our gate equation as before we are going to have if we look at the r squared stuff let's maybe this stuff and this stuff we'll have qm a2, B2. Happy ish because what do we do with this square, right? Like here we have a square and here we didn't. So maybe we're happy, maybe we're not. And where we're very unhappy is there are actually cross terms. So we have R times UM. Uh, A1, B2. And we also have R U M A two B one. Hopefully you can see where these come from. Do stop me at any point if things are unclear. So the question is Yeah, how do we do how do we get rid of this square? How do we get rid of all this stuff? And the solution comes from Nova is by making things homogeneous. So now let's do the same thing, but with a homogeneous equation. So ul a plus u right b plus u out c plus our multiplication times a b plus b c. Cool. And we said we want to make this. Um, homogeneous, so we'll introduce a new variable u, and we'll plug it everywhere we need to make the degrees higher. So our maximum degree is here, degree 2, because we're ignoring the selectors. So let's make everything of degree 2. Easy. Now if we do the same thing as before, u, ul, a, and actually try to distribute it out, if we have u equals u1 plus r, u2, and A equals A1 plus R A2. Hopefully you see where this is going. U1 plus R U2. I could have left to A1 plus R A2. Again, we can group things in powers of R. So we're going to have R to the zero times stuff plus, plus R to the one times stuff. R squared kind of stuff. So the R to the zero stuff is this and I guess this. So U1, UL, A1. And this is great because this looks a lot like that. Very happy. Um, R squared stuff will be easy as well because there's just two terms. And don't forget the QL. So U2, UL, A2. This is great, again, because this now looks like our gate equation. If we have the square just like we did for our multiplication gate, if we go back, yeah, we, we do have the same thing as here. And we have the pesky parts of the one turn. So it's going to be U1, RA2, and this, that. Well, U1, A2, plus UL, U2, A1. Okay. I'm not going to write out the full, like, I'm not going to distribute the whole gate equation. Hopefully, you can see how I am going to end up with 
what I promised on the slides, which was gate of trace prime plus R times stuff plus R squared gate of trace double prime. Or trace one, trace two. Sorry, I've been using one and two here. Let me rewrite this. Okay. And hopefully you can also see that the stuff is not dependent on R. It's it's always fully determined by this equation. How do we get rid of the stuff? We actually say, all right, we have another term here, and this term will contain this stuff. Okay. So now, if I go back to the paper, actually, I'm just going to share my screen entirely a little easier. I'm going to go back and forth. All right. Back to the paper. Hopefully we have some justification as to why the equation is as it is here. The next question is why do we need commitments? Like, what am I doing here? And this is to satisfy the knowledge soundness property. If you remember from the slides, The knowledge found that says, if you know a valid witness to the outputs of the folding verifier, you must have known valid witnesses for the inputs. How do we do this? Well, with commitments. The, the commitments sort of force you to come up with a unique witness. It's sort of saying the new witness has to be the sum of the previous witnesses with this random term to some high probability, right? If maybe the random term is, um, I don't know, allows for some tricks. Here we have all these R values, which I didn't discuss in the slides. It's because we're working with hiding commitments. So the commitments have, you commit to all the values in your vector, and you also commit to this extra value to hide your commitment, so that even if you're committing twice the same vector, the commitments will be different. Cool. A slightly important point is to sort of say, like, why do we care about Plonk specifically? Because Plonk can capture any computation. So any computation can be expressed as a Plonk circuit. But also a Plonk circuit is easy to verify. If I give you a valid trait, you have a polynomial time algorithm that can read through the trait and make sure that it's correct. And with the algorithm, we'll just check the rules. Check that the squares are equal to each other and go row by row and check that the equation holds. That is a polynomial time algorithm. So those two conditions mean that Plonk is what we call NP complete. It captures all the problems of NP and it is itself part of NP. We want to make sure that by relaxing Plonk, we haven't lost that property. So what I'm saying is take any sort of Plonk circuit, set the scalar u to be one, the error vector to be zero, and you actually now have a relaxed Plonk circuit. So any Plonk circuit can be expressed in a relaxed Plonk circuit. And we already said any computation can be expressed in a Plonk circuit. So if we follow through, we actually have any computation can be expressed in a relaxed Plonk circuit. Is relaxed Plonk itself part of NP? Yes, you can still check it in polynomial time. You do have to do a bit more work because you have to check the commitments, but it's still polynomial time. Now the next part, we talk about the actual construction. And here we're following the formal definition from NOVA. So they say the folding scheme has four algorithms, uh, a generator algorithm, 
I, I forgot how they call it. I think this is like a DGen algorithm, approve and a verifier. So first you generate your parameters, and in our case, it's going to be parameters to produce commitments. So we need to commit to the witness columns. So these are, in the paper, it's size S. And we need to commit to the error vector, which is actually the whole length of the column, which is N plus S plus one. And again, this is just formalism. Some people write it differently. Um, the key to an algorithm is sort of there to keep things very generic, um, but actually we don't really use it. The um, verifying key is nothing. And the proving key is the circuit, US, the verifying key, which was nothing, and the public parameters. Now what I'm saying here is the verifier is given two committed relaxed instances and the notation is super ugly, but it's the best I could do <laughs> because there's a lot of um, variables and it's like, all right, how do we keep things relatively clear? So big X is a normal Planck in instance. U is the, the scalar from the relaxed Planck instance. And all these things with little bars at the top are commitments. Is this being recorded? I am not sure. That's more a question for Carlos or the rest of the organization team. Uh, similarly, we have a second instance of the same shape. It is beautiful. The prover has the instances as well, and it also has the witness. So. Big W is the lower part of the table. We go back here. This is Big W. E is the error vector. And all of these R's are the randomnesses that we use for our commitment. Now, the reason we need to keep track of them is because if we still want our commitments to open correctly, once we've added them together, we need to add the randomnesses together. So first round, the prover samples a random RT because we're going to do a commitment and computes a commitment to T where T is computed as this. Where does this come from? So this QM times A prime B prime, uh, A prime B second, A second B prime is actually what we have drawn out here, this stuff. Let me write it out again. If you factor out the R's, factor out the QM, you're left with A1, B2, plus A2, B1. So hopefully this isn't super surprising. This stuff up here, U second times QL A prime and U prime times QL A second is this stuff. Let me point to it correctly. Right. And then we do it for all the other, so all the other, I guess, degree one gates. And this one I haven't expanded earlier. But this is the cross term for this term here. Cool. I'm using vector notation here because actually I'm saying, all right, T is the vector because we have a T value at every row and we're computing all of these values in one go. So once you've committed to this, the verifier samples a challenge at random. This is going to be the challenge that you use to fold your traces together. Using the challenge, you can fold the top part of the trace, the public inputs, you can fold the scalar, and you can fold the commitments. Using, notice here, this commitment to T that we got in the first round. And then the prover does the equivalent stuff, but over the uncommitted values, W's and E's, and over the randomnesses to make sure that the 
commitment still open correctly? I'll stop here for questions. Sorry about No question. Either I've lost everyone or it's a very good thing. Well, I'll just wait a few seconds to see QB is typing. speaking instead of typing just ask to be on the stage and we can just give you permission and therefore you can ask uh, with your voice inst instead of texting which might be annoying for for some things so yeah that's, that's it yeah um we can look at the proof if you're interested um i'll first do custom gates how do we deal with custom gates let's say um oh Oh, wait a tiny bit more. I still see someone typing. I'll get started and oh, no, the question is in size with us afterwards. Absolutely, they're actually already on my GitHub, I think. I'll share the link at the end. Um, okay, so custom gate of degree two. Let's keep things simple for now. We'll read this custom gate as a new selector, QG, and some function G where G is of degree two. And if we were to write the full gate equation, like the full new rule, this is what it would look like. This is classic long gate plus the new stuff. How do we fold? First thing we need to do is our function G, we actually need to break it down into a sum because we need to make our whole gate homogeneous, right? So we break it down into a sum by actually having new selectors. We need a selector for, oh, ignore that actually. We keep the same selector, but we have the degree one part of our gate, the degree two part of our gate, and any constant part of it. And as before, we make things homogeneous, so we multiply by u squared the constant part. We leave the degree two part alone, and we multiply by u. This is all in one bracket the degree one part. And folding still happens as we saw it earlier. Just now we have a new cross term. We'll have cross terms that arise from uh, the degree two part of QG. Wait, did I mess this up? Oh yeah, no, that's fine. The degree two part of QG, we have cross terms that come from the constant part of it and a cross, cross, cross term here from, oops, can't highlight the right thing doesn't want me to highlight, it, but I hope you see what I'm talking about, degree one part. So that's relatively easy. Degree two custom gates, what we need to do is just change our expression for T. And everything else, the whole protocol happens in the same way. So that is quite powerful because it means at no extra cost, we get to do two, three, any number of multiplications we want inside our gate, 
right? We're not limited to QM A1 and B1. We can also do Q, you know, another multiplication selector and say, oh, I want A times C or something. Um, with three variables, not super interesting. So can we do it with more variables? And the answer is yes. And it's not written anywhere here. Okay. Um, if you have a wider circuit, hopefully you already have the intuition for this. Um, we need one more witness column. This matrix is just one row bigger. So is this matrix. Um, and the cross term Q will change, obviously, to take into account the new gate equation and the new columns. Um, but otherwise, pretty simple. The only thing is we have this extra commitment that we need to deal with. So our instances are bigger by one element. And the work of the folding verifier is bigger by one point addition. Oh, actually, it was here. Higher funding find out, but I think they didn't really pop it. Higher degree custom gate. I think I wrote that as a degree three gate. So I have this random degree three gate that multiplies three inputs together. If we want to relax that equation, same as before, we now take our constant stuff and multiply it by u cube. U one gets multiplied by anything of degree two, and u squared gets multiplied by anything of degree one. The cross term will now have this form. I'm debating whether or not to show this for a simple equation, because it is um, a lot of work. Do you trust me? <laughs> that this works or do you want to see the map written out if you really want to see the map written out say so in the chat otherwise we will work based off of trust but essentially we'll have these sort of degree three cross terms like and by that i mean you're expanding a polynomial of degree three now so you no longer have just like a plus two ab plus uh b squared a squared plus b. yeah you see what i'm going for um you have a much wider one so now you have these three popping up and these two is popping up eventually we'll get to a point where computing these cross terms is actually quite costly even though it's just uh field arithmetic and it's happening outside of a circuit we still have to commit to these vectors, and that is a whole multiplayer multiplication. Okay, proofs. Proofs, proofs, proofs. Completeness. So to show completeness, what we do is we say, okay, we have two pairs, u prime, w prime, and u second, w second. Ooh. We say that both of these are satisfying. So if I if I run, sorry, if I apply the gate equation to either of these things, I should get zero. Then the question is, what happens when I apply the gate equation to this thing, which is the output of the folding protocol, the prover's output in the folding protocol? So. How do we do this? Well, we're going to write out the gate equation. And here I'm doing it in parts because these equations are too big to fit on one line. We write out the gate equation for the output. So it's stuff that doesn't have dashes or double dashes. And as we go along, I'll replace with dashes and double dashes. And this notation lin q is just to say, oh, the linear part of the gate. So if you run through it, here we have u times lin plus r lin. And because this is linear, I can go from here, where the r's are inside the linear, the lin part, to here, where the r is outside. Hopefully that's fine. Um, and now it's about multiplying this stuff by these new u's. And as we saw earlier, we'll have power 0 times this thing, which looks like the input, 
R squared times the same thing and the cross term. So the cross terms we all package into this TLI because it's like term for linear and we'll use this later. Similarly, we have the multiplication gate, which we actually wrote out together on the whiteboard. So hopefully this cross term should be familiar to you. Um, yeah. And then we have the constant cross term, which is the one I didn't write out. But we have this is squared. So this distributes out to u prime squared plus two u u prime, two sorry, u dash, u double dash, plus u double dash squared. Multiply that by qc everywhere. And similarly, again, we have this cross term, which hopefully you recognize from the t equation earlier. Bringing this all together, if we say the new e is actually the old e plus r squared, the other old e, like the left and right inputs, minus all the cross terms that we defined above, we're back to what we actually um, claim for our definition of E. And so we can write, nicely write, applying the gate to the folded output is the same as applying the gate to the left input plus R squared times applying the gate to the right input. And because these things were valid, satisfying assignments, this is equal to zero. This is equal to zero times r squared, still zero, so we have zero at the end. We have to show also the, the copy constraints are preserved. And this is sort of what I showed you intuitively with the colors matching. So I won't show the math. Sorry. I'll do the whole screen again. I want to the math, but the math is essentially saying this. Uh, R times the blue squares, this, these things are still equal. And if we add things that are equal to each other, sorry, if we add things that are mutually equal, then we'll have something that is equal. So we're saying, all right, if M prime, so anything prime is from the left instance. If the left instance IJ is equal to the left instance or the left trace alpha beta, so we're saying these blue squares here. And we're doing the same same indices, but on the other side. So same indices on the other side. If these two things are equal, if I take the addition, that is still equal. And I'll replace this from our equation of the folding. So we know that this is actually, this is equal to that because that's how we folded. And this right-hand side is equal to this right-hand side here because that's how we folded. And so we found that our blue squares for the final trace are equal. Cool. Commitments, are the commitments still valid? And this is sort of where the homomorphic property of the commitments kicks in. We're saying, okay, the output commitment was by definition, the left input plus r times the right input. So if we write this out in our commitment notation, we're saying we have a commitment to the vector wk prime. So I'm using k to say like any one of abc. So it's a commitment to the left witness vector with some randomness plus r times a commitment to the right instance vector plus some randomness. And because our commitment is additively homomorphic, I can say, okay, this is a commitment to the sum of the vectors with the sum of the randomnesses. And this is why it's very important that we use a commitment scheme that is additively homomorphic. Because going from line 54 to 55 is only true when our commitment scheme is additively homomorphic. You can throw the same for E, but working with three commitments. Um, and once you've done that, you've showed that the gate equation is preserved, the copy constraints is preserved, and the commitment opening are preserved. So you actually have a satisfying assignment to the circuit. So to recap what we did here, we said, start with two satisfying assignments, come up with a new assignment, and show that it is satisfying. 
and we showed it because it does satisfy the, the gate constraint, as we saw here. It does satisfy the copy constraint, and it does satisfy the commitment token. Knowledge soundness is harder. The knowledge soundness, we say, okay, let's devise an extractor. So this is some kind of device or some kind of program that takes the prover as input and gets to manipulate the prover. As if you can imagine this as the extractor being able to debug the prover. So I'm debugging the prover and I get to rerun it multiple times from the same breakpoint. So I'm going to set a breakpoint after the prover has committed to T. So I want to have always the same initial commitment to T. And I'm going to run the prover from that point three times. And we get three transcripts from this. And three transcripts means I'll get three different randomnesses from the verifier, and I'll get three different outputs of the new folded trace. And from these three new outputs, I will essentially do Gaussian elimination to recover the witnesses that the prover started with before committing to T. So the extraction strategy, we said that we have three different values for R. So let's see, let me actually show it from here. We have three different values for R. And in this equation, we know W and these W primes and W double dash are unknowns. So we actually need two values of R to be able to solve this equation and to recover these values. Is that fine with everyone? Cool. So two unknowns, we use two values of R and we recover the two unknowns. Similarly for the error, sorry, I'm sliding like crazy. For the error, we have three unknowns, E prime, T, e, and E double dash. So we're gonna have to use three equations. So we use three different values of R to have three different equations, and we'll be able to recover all three of these terms. So that's our extractor strategy. That's great. That's not enough to prove that we have valid summit. We said, okay, if you allow me to debug the prover, I can come up with witness, like candidate values for the incoming witnesses and the incoming error terms. Now I need to show that they're actually satisfying assignments. And so this is what happens in the rest of the knowledge standard proof. I say, okay, now that I've extracted things, I will show that they actually correspond to the commitments that we had. I will show that the gate equation is still satisfied. And I will show that the copy constraints are still satisfied. This is slightly involved, um, just because I guess we are once again working through the logic of I have an instance witness pair, I need to prove that it satisfies the equation. We're sort of doing it the wrong way around. Um, let's see, what's the overhead to using Splunk? Yes. Okay, I'll take that question in a second. So this will ignore it. The important part is that we need to show that our commitments are valid. And remember that for our witness, we have extracted the witness from only two transcripts, from only two runs of um, the prover. Whereas for the error term, we had three runs. So we need to make sure that whatever witness came from the third run actually is still valid and still has the right commitment. And this is sort of where we don't have perfect knowledge on this, we actually have something probabilistic because we have some value and we hope that it corresponds to some commitment. And here we call upon the binding property of the commitment, which says that um, the, the commitment can only, like there won't be a collision. There is only one vector for which we can open the commitment. And this is where the negligible probability comes in, and this is where we end up with our extractor working with 
almost like one minus something negligible for the tier of the successive extractor. This is a very high level run of the knowledge sandwich proof. What's important is the strategy here. The strategy of first I show how to extract witnesses from as many transcripts as they want. And then I show that these are valid witnesses. Very important to that second part. Finally, zero knowledge is kind of the easier one of the bunch. The only messages being exchanged are a hiding commitment and a random value. And so even without knowing a valid witness, I can produce such a commitment and such a random value. There is no decision making on the verifier side, so there's nothing that I need to satisfy. So it's very easy to produce a valid transcript without ever knowing the witnesses. Cool. I think I'll stop there for the presentation side. I'll just take this question on knowledge soundness. Is knowledge soundness of W six R W prime under Sangria stricter, more relaxed than knowledge soundness of W W prime individually on their own? So we're talking about knowledge soundness of the protocol. So the knowledge soundness property of the protocol says if you know a valid witness sorry, I'm I'm sharing this this you don't want to be saying this. If you know a valid witness to this instance X, which is the output of the polling verifier, then with high probability, you knew valid witnesses to X1 and X2. There's no, like, the witness W1 and W2, it's not like they're probabilistically witnesses, that they, they do satisfy X1 and X2, for sure. I don't know if that really is answering your question, but my point being here, It's sort of a, not a relation, relation is the wrong word. It's just saying, okay, I should be able to from a valid witness to X and enough transcripts, I should be able to produce valid witnesses to W1, W2. So you can't really compare them. There is a probability of knowing W1 and there's a probability of knowing W2 under some, right. Yes. Okay. Okay. If that's the question, then yes, it is. Individually, there's a policy of knowing W1. This one. The president of the two, essentially. Yeah. So it's slightly lower, right? There might be some values W and for which you can't actually extract valid witnesses W1, W2. But these are extremely negligible. Like this, this happens almost never. And so we assume that this is fine. Cool. Oh, sharing my screen for now. And I'll take the question from QB. What's the overhead to using Splunk over R1CS? Nova versus Sangria. Can you talk a bit about relaxed R1CS versus relaxed Splunk? for comparison metrics on verification costs. Okay. So Plunk and or one cs are two different arithmetizations, as you know. In Plunk, we say with every row, we have one addition and one multiplication. But then we came up with these extensions of, oh, we can have wider circuits. We can have custom gates. So actually with custom gates and wider circuits, you can say, at each row, I have some number of addition, some number of multiplication. With R1CS, you say at each row, I have as many additions as I want, but I have only one multiplication. So the question is, okay, the way I see this essentially is by saying we allow multiple multiplications we allow, we allow a high number of multiplications per row. In Plunk, we're saying, actually, I can do parallel computation. I can compute things at the same time, whereas R1CS allows me only one, um, one multiplication per step. This isn't the whole picture, because you also have the proof system and how fast the proof system is. And this is where 
I, I don't have good comparisons or benchmarks. I think the general understanding is that Planck is faster than something like Marlin, for example, for most practical circuits. Also, feel free to shoot questions. I think we're into the Q&A section fully. What about lookups? OK. I like that question. Uh, so lookups, there are two articles by Ariel Gabson, who, whose name you'll hopefully recognize, about how to do lookups in block, not necessarily in some kind of folding. So this first one from Aristoraps. So it says, okay, a, an error is the right hand side of the punk trace. So just the witness and the instance. A P error or pair is a trace and the selectors. And this article sort of says, OK, if you're allowed for one round of interaction, if you're allowed the verifier to give a random value, then you can create this wrap, which is our error or PR as we saw it before, with this extra column that is generated using a gamma value, which is given by the verifier. And if you're familiar with Plonk, this is actually the ground product argument. And checking this ground product, actually comes down to this equation, which is a constraint of degree two. Right. So this article says you can do what we call a multi-set check by adding one round, one round of interaction, adding one column, and applying a degree two constraint. Constraints of degree two and columns are things that we can deal with very nicely. The round of interaction is a bit more dodgy, and this is where I'm still working on it. Because essentially, you need to make sure that this gamma value comes from the verifier, that it is truly random. So either using Fetchimir, random oracle, or actually having an interaction. And that means you have sort of a little, un you have a bit of an unstable state. This wrap, so this thing with this extra column, is slightly unstable because I only know that this thing is valid if I know that the gamma is valid. So it poses questions for analysis on this. And I think this blog post called Origami by, I think it's also PSC people. I don't know that right here. Um, origami builds on this idea, applies it specifically to the Halo 2 lookup argument. Um, but I'm still, yeah, I'm still not sure that we fully solved the, the knowledge on this question. So yeah, work in progress. But the intuition, I think, is, is out there, and I do think it works. So there's also another article, which is linked here, how you can do copy constraints and look at tables from multi-set checks. So I'll link that as well. Any more questions? I have a couple of them, so you prefer to do them now or later? Yeah, let's take them now, sure. Okay, so um, the first one is uh, towards the cycle of curves that you need to use. Yeah. Uh, so, so if you plan to use, for example, like BN and Gram King or something like this, where one of the curves has pairing but the other doesn't, uh, 
like how how can you like merge both things together at the end so that you end up with a single proof that you can for example verify in ethereum or something like that and kind of related to that is do you think something like hyperplonk on one side and ipa on the other one or like some kind of a scheme like this would work better yeah um so multiple things in here the first thing is the curve cycle effect like indeed we don't have curves efficient cycles where you have parents on both sides um when you work with cycles you do have to verify the proof at the end on both sides of your cycle and the question is can you how can you actually bring everything back to one side um answer is i don't know the sort of naive way of doing this is by having um sorry i was clicking on the link uh the naive way of doing this is by having a prover on your bn side that reads in the proof from the grumpkin side and actually performs the verification so you, you you're back to doing a snark with snark but you're doing it in non-native arithmetic so that's going to be super expensive the other approach is um i think what aspect have been working on with what zach called goblin plonk uh, let me find the link and I mean, I'm not exactly sure what they do, but it's it's addressing the same problem. Uh, just with respect to the origami link, I think that's the wrong one. So that is, there there's a little naming collision. People got very trigger happy with the name origami because folding. Uh, origami lookups is here. So there's this one sort of VDF-ish construction that was called origami which i've been in touch with the author i don't think works unfortunately um but this origami lookups is essentially based on what i was showing you earlier this idea that you get multi-set checks from um a round of interaction a column and a new degree to uh constraint Sorry, um, Carlos, did I fully answer your question, or did I skip the second part? So you skipped the part of uh, whether uh, hyperplong oh, and yes. IPA would kind of fix this. Yes. Uh, so IPA fixes it because we no longer need pairing. Um, hyperplong, you still need some kind of commitment scheme, right? So again, you can use hyperplong, but not with a pairing based commitment scheme. One funny thing about hyperplong, which I'll show you now, if I bring up the paper, is there might be a nice synergy between uh, the relaxed plonk arithmetic and hyperplong. So here is hyperplong, and here is sort of how they arithmetize their thing. They say, okay, we take the Boolean hypercube, so all the prop all the possible Boolean values. And we hard code that everything that starts with zero zero is left. Is like our left column in our clone trace. Anything that starts with zero one is our right column. Anything that starts with one zero is our output. But notice that the one one doesn't exist. Like there's nothing hard coded into one one. But we still do our sum check over the whole hypercube. So the nice thing is we could actually plug in M one one to be the error vector. And we're still doing a sum check over the same size hypercube, but we've thrown in our error vector kind of for free. So yeah, that was kind of a, a funny little thing about hyperplunk. I'm not sure exactly if it works, but it's something I wanted to explore. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it doesn't solve the, the question you were asking about, Carlos, of like, how do we bring back the proof that is on both BN254 and Grumkin and have it in a single BN254 proof. I, I appreciate uh, There's also one more thing which uh, has been discussed uh, this morning at, uh, at Suzalu, which is related to like how, how do you see uh, lattices being kind of 
like the next thing to be used. So we have post-quantum properties, we have additively homomorphic commitments with them also, and we, like, of course I'm not saying that's easy to find, but we could even, like, have things that use, like, 64-bit fields or even less. So what this thing kind of look like? Uh, the future that work? Or what I'm working on at the moment, yeah. Like, that is exactly what I'm working on at the moment. Okay, that's really cool. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I won't spill too much of the beans until we're we're fully there. But yeah, that's kind of the work going on. Um, I'll just take the question from Kilich in the chat. Uh, what exactly is knowledge on this problem you just mentioned when you when we just interpret Halo two subset argument as just custom gates? So the problem is in the Halo two lookup argument, or similarly in the lookup argument, you have this verifier randomly. And the knowledge soundness of the lookup argument only holds if the random value that you use to build your ground product, if I bring back Ariel's article. Here. So you build this extra column. And this extra column, essentially, if this column passes this constraint check, you have a so-called a valid multi-set check. But to go from multi set to lookup, you actually need this gamma to be randomly selected. If we were to fold these, we actually need to also fold the gamma. And so the output that we have no longer has this uniform distribution of the gamma. So I'm not sure that the knowledge soundness proof of lookup or Halo 2 as it is out of the box applies to this folded lookup column. Yeah. I do think it will work. We just need to be careful about how we prove it. Do you envision any way on which cross terms don't blow up with wide automatizations in Plunkit? It's hard to tell. So someone has been talking about a, like specific families of functions where the cross terms kind of uh, go to zero kind of very nicely or cancel out. Um, I don't know much about those. But essentially, yes, we could try to define our gate equation specifically so that the cross terms are very light. Don't know what that would look like. Um, the other thing is there was this recent talk at ZK Summit about the red wedding where they managed to get rid of a bunch of columns because they are fully determined by the other columns. And maybe some similar thinking can be applied here. Also, this is just one strategy for folding. This is just applying the Nova strategy of let's make our equation homogeneous, let's add a merit term to absorb the cross terms, and we're good. Maybe there are other strategies in which, um, yeah, which are more amenable to high degree gaze or wider circuits. What about folding for lattice-based systems? Work in progress. Oh, as in, wait, maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're saying. Oh, oh ZK verified fully homomorphic. Uh, so this we can already do, right? We can already write uh, a circuit that performs lots of operations and you prove it. It's going to be a pretty big circuit.
I don't know if you're speaking, Carlos, but I can't hear you. My bad. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so it has been one hour, one hour and a half plus of session. So yep. uh, I don't know how m more questions like do you want to take. Also, if there's anything left that you want to mention or explain. Uh. In terms of things I wanted to bring up, I think that's it from my side. But I have to take a few more questions if there are any. Sure. Are there any more questions for the, from the audience? I see no one typing. So I... I will assume everything is clear. Um, so yeah, thank you very much uh, for for this session and for like explaining and guiding us through the paper and the protocol and allowing us to understand much better how it works. Uh, I've tried to record this, but I'm not in the best setup at all to do so. So uh, I hope that some of my teammates have recorded too, and we can like put this somewhere so that anyone can like review it again and yeah just uh express our gratitude with you nico and and like say thank you very much uh from so good. thanks for having me and from, and from everyone and yeah i think we will wrap up here so thank you everyone also for attending and hopefully we will continue with these uh learning sessions so yeah nico uh round of applause and <laughs> And thank you very thank you very much for for everything uh we'll wrap up here guys so take care and talk to you soon Thanks. Bye.